I just want to kind of throw a promo out and uh, re remind you guys that if you haven't plugged into one of our, our small groups, one of our community groups is what we call them, uh, you still can do that. We'd love for you to do it. You might have seen some of the things that the community groups were doing this last week. It was uh, a good week. And one of the groups went over to Snipe Pack for Kids and, and just packed up a lot of lunches for those guys. And then um, my small group went to the park and made hot dogs and passed them out to couple hundred people and it's just good to be in our community and showing the love of Christ and that's what it's about and so we'd love for you to engage in that way with us if you have questions about it come see me come see Jason Hendrick at the back uh, we can talk to you about that so with that said we're going to uh, continue in our series we're in the sixth week of a series on Ephesians we're in chapter four today and so uh, let's just pray for God's provision father we just love you and praise you thank you for your loving grace as always Lord, I pray that today, that as we dig into your word, that you will just open our eyes and heart to receive what you have for us. Lord, I just pray as we do, you are glorified. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to start you out with a story today, because um, I know you love my stories. So, um, I, I guess I was 22 years old when I went to work at a retail store it's at Eddie Bauer. You've probably heard me talk about it before. And they hired me to be the stock manager. And that was kind of a, a term they gave me, but guess what? I wasn't managing nobody. Uh, I, was, I was back there by myself, and the only thing I was managing was some stock. And so uh, I did that, and uh, I eventually moved through every uh, part of the, the company you could until I ran the store for a number of years. And that was a great training place for, for myself. It was a great training place for anybody that went through there and engaged the process. If you've ever been a part of a, a, a small box retail store, you do everything. You manage payroll, you manage your uh, inventory, you, man you manage everything. And so I had to deal with a lot of that. And I was thinking about that this week, and what I was thinking about specifically was is how hard they worked for us to get some standards, standards that you could scale to go to hundreds of stores. And so if you walked into one Eddie Bauer store, even though it might look a little bit different on the outside, you were greeted the same way because it was a specific standard. Within so many seconds, somebody would come up and talk to you. And they'd probably ask you a question that was an open-ended question because that's what they were taught to do. There were standards in how we would fold clothes like a shirt. You would put it on a board, and then you would fold, 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 and you'd put it up, and it'd be nice and tight, and you'd put a sticker on it, right? And you go in the store, and you're like, well, that just happens. No, it's a standard they put in place that everybody did throughout the, the company. We would do the same thing with jeans. We'd do the th same thing with everything we did, whether it was signage. Uh, and, you know, some of that fits my personality. I love standards. I love rules. Occasionally, I would veer from those rules, and sometimes it might give me a little trouble. And I, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but one time what I did was uh, we had a... A, a shirt that was on sale. And this is totally not what I was going to talk about this morning. We had a shirt that was on sale, and it was like it was like on sale for like like nine bucks, nine ninety nine or something. We had hundreds of them, and they were just in the stock room. And so I put them in the front window on a Friday night, so for the weekend, and I put a sign on the window that said "Like these shirts?" Question mark nine ninety nine. I mean, and we just blew out of them. And then Monday morning when we had a conference call, they're like, hey, Matt, what'd you do to sell those shirts? Because there's reports that pull up about your top items and everything. And I was like, oh, because we're not supposed to do that. And we're not supposed to do that. So anyway, there were standards that were in place. But there was a reason that the standards were there. And to hold me accountable for those standards, they had my district manager, which would hold the conference call. And, uh, and, and also she'd come visit me and the other stores. And occasionally, twice in my career, I was there seven and a half years, the regional vice president would come and make sure that they were withholding the standards, that, uh, for us to hold the standards that they had set in place. Are you tracking with me? There's a reason for that. They wanted there to be a baseline, so that way when they went from store to store, it was going to be the same. So if you went in Eddie Bauer store, or this happens across the board in retail and all kinds of businesses, so you know who you are. you got to know who you are. If you walk into one place, you're going to know uh, basically what to expect, Right? Well, I was thinking about that this week as I was reading Ephesians chapter 4. Imagine that. Because Paul has, has gone through and told us who we are in Christ. He has told us a number of things about who we are. Remember in chapter 1, you probably heard me say it so many times, we are redeemed, we are adopted, we have been... Uh, uh, I'm totally forgetting what I'm saying. We've been adopted. We've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. There are so many blessings that have been put on us. He wanted to remind us over and over who we are in Christ. Who we are in Christ. Then he told us it wasn't just for the Jews. It was for the Gentile too. And then he told us that God can do a measure more than we can ask or imagine. Right? We go into chapter 4. He begins to talk about unity. If you're going to have unity... 
There's some baselines that you have to have. First of all, you have to know who you are. And that's what he's done in the first part of the book. You see, the book of Ephesians is broken down into two specific parts. The first three chapters is telling us our identity and telling us who we are in the body of Christ. The second part of the book is telling us practical ways that that should be revealed. Ways that we should live that out. How we can see that that's happening. And if we are identifying ourselves as believers, this should be somewhat about what our life looks like. And so that's a basis for where we're going today in chapter 4. And I've gone through this a couple of times, so I'll tell you, we're not going to make it very far. And y'all might not be surprised by that. So let's go ahead and go to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read to you. He starts off and he says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, To live a life worthy of a calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now, let's start with the very first sentence there. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord. And you know where Paul's at right now, right? Paul is in a Roman prison. He's surrounded by Roman soldiers, by Roman guards. But yet he identifies himself as a prisoner, prisoner for the Lord. And I was thinking about that. I was like, you know what? I love Paul. And I love that everything he does, he identifies himself as one that is doing it for Jesus. And so I just thought, you know, that'd be a good reminder for us as we go in tomorrow, maybe to our schools, maybe into our workplace, that if we're an employee. We're not just an employee for Eddie Bauer. We're not just an employee for Pantex. We're not just an employee for the school district. We are an employee for the Lord. We're an employee for the Lord. We are a husband or a wife, a spouse for the Lord. We're a friend. We're a companion. We're a a neighbor for the Lord. And may we always remember that. If we do that, it gives us a baseline for where we draw our strength, for what we're doing. And we're going to talk a little bit about relationships and how that goes next week. In fact, we're going to talk a little bit about marriage. But if you're not married, you're like, man, I don't want to come because I'm not married. Let me tell you, it's also about if you want to be married or if you're just in a relationship Or if you even have friends. You've got friends? Okay. So everybody can relate to that. Let me get back to this. Okay. It says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now, he's talking about unity. That's where he's going. He's talking about unity, how we can become one. Remember, he said the last week, it was two weeks ago, we talked about that we, the Jew and the Gentile are coming together. And you can imagine that Paul would have to explain himself a little bit how that's going to work. And he says here that they would bear together through humble and gentleness and bearing with one another in love. Now, humble is something that maybe you're good at. I don't know. Sometimes we struggle with being humble. I remember when I was a kid, my dad told me a little saying that I always remembered that made me want to be humble. And I was just a... A little guy, I don't remember how old I was, but we were traveling somewhere, going down the street, and there was a guy that we had seen, and the guy was pretty proud of himself, and my dad looked at me and he said, Matt, there's nothing as unimpressive as a man impressive himself. You can write that down. Denny Johnson said it. That was my dad. (laughs) My dad, he said, there's nothing as unimpressive as a man impressed with himself. There's something to say about somebody that is humble. No matter what they've done, no matter where they've been, they still are humble. You wouldn't know the difference. The other thing it says, if we're going to have unity, is that we've got to be not just humble, but we've got to be gentle. We've got to be gentle. And when you go to a different translation of the Bible, and I read the NIV, but when you go to the King James, it says, take a position of lowliness and meekness. Lowliness and meekness. And when I think about lowliness, I think about what Christ did. I think about Christ when when he left the throne to come here. And he took a position as a carpenter and as a person that was not in great high esteem in the world. He walked with people that were sinners, that were tax collectors, that were prostitutes. He took a position where he would kneel down at people's feet and wash their feet. He took a position of lowliness. That's what it means to be humble. Is that you're never better than any situation. You're never better than anyone beside you. And you can always find a way to serve them. The other thing I like is when it talks about meekness. Now, many times when we think about being meek, we think about being weak, and that's not really what it means at all. In fact, I believe it's taking the power you have through God and, 
and you contain that and show it in love and gentleness and kindness. And I think one of the greatest examples of being meek is, and, and being able to restrain your power is, is our Father in heaven. Have you ever thought about this? That many times in Scripture, God saw his people, especially the Israelites, were doing things that they shouldn't have been doing. And God would allow them to continue down their ways, encouraging them to change, sending prophets to to speak into them, to change their ways, to repent and go a different direction. And the whole time, God could have just wiped them out. Many times when we're doing things we shouldn't be doing, God has patience with us because he can restrain himself. When you have all that power, you have to have even more power to restrain it. You do. And that's what I think of with meekness. There may be a situation that you can overpower. There may be somebody that you could uh, bully with your words or your knowledge, but that's not what we're supposed to do. Instead, we're supposed to uh, use our love and influence that he has given us through the spirit that he's given us. And so it says if we're going to bear together in love, and remember he's talking about unity. I I just want to remind you what it means to Bear together in love. Remember, if you're going to act with love, you've got to be connected to the source of love. And if you remember who the source of love is, it's not you and me. That source of love is God. We've got to be connected to God. And when you are connected to the source of love, the creator of love, who is love, it's more likely that what will flow out of you and me will be love, will be gentle, and be humbleness. Remember, we're still on the topic of being unified. And that's where we're fixing to go. He actually actually say those words. It says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Then it says, there is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope, when you were called the one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We should be one. As the body of Christ, it doesn't matter what church you go to. It doesn't matter uh, some side beliefs you have. There should be some core issues, which it names right here, that we should surround ourselves and unify with and move forward as a unified body. But you know what? We're not. We're not. I believe the, the church, the Christian church, God's church, is more divided than it's ever been. And I, w- I want to tell you an example of this that hit me specifically a few weeks ago. I was at a customer's property. I go to a lot of ranches, and I was at a ranch. I was walking this place. It was absolutely beautiful. And it was a great time to bring up Jesus because, you know, it had to be something amazing to make this, right, because it was beautiful. And so I was bringing up my relationship with Christ and coming to find out the man I was talking to, he had a, a deep relationship with Christ. He, uh, deep in the Word of God, in fact, I looked through his window. He's like, that's where I study right there. And he looks out on this beautiful landscape. And uh, he had his books. His Bible was there and he had all this laying out. And I began to talk with him about it. He began to tell me a lot about his faith. And then at one point he says to me, he says, well, Matt, where do you go to church at? And I was like, oh, why don't you ask? I'll tell you. And I told him about the loft. I told him about what we're doing. And guess what he said? He said, Matt, I... He goes, I'm not trying to offend you, but I don't necessarily think that's good. That's what he said. And he went on to tell me why. And the reason why he didn't think what we're doing is good, which I'm saying we're doing, a non-denominational church is doing why it couldn't be good, is because he was so driven by some core issues that drive denominational churches that he couldn't possibly see how a non-denominational church could be good. And so he was talking to me about these things, and as I was receiving this and listening to this, I was like, man, this is why the church is divided. It's divided because we look at certain issues and stuff, and we make it bigger than what it's supposed to be, and the core issues we kind of sweep under the table, and it becomes about something other than what it was supposed to be. And so... uh, there's not really supposed to be this big divide where there's Methodist and there's, there's Presbyterian. and there's, I mean, it, it, it shouldn't be that way, right? It's not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be that we're united in one body. One body. You see, um, whenever I study the Word of God, I study it a certain way. And I put it through a couple of filters. 
And I believe those filters can help me not get off on tangents like that. That can be divisive. I, I, I plan on spending my time on things that unify, not things that divide. That's where I plan on spending my time. Because I believe that's where we need to be. And I think, think the things that are divisive are, really can be divisive. In fact, I talked a few weeks ago just briefly about predestination. I told you there's people that fall right here and there's people that fall right here. And these are people that are seeking the Holy Spirit. These are people that are seeking the Word of God. I mean, they're doing everything they can to, to seek God's guidance on it. And they still fall on both sides of the fence. And so why would we make that a big deal? Because it has nothing to do with our salvation. It doesn't have anything to do with our walk. It has nothing to do with that. And so people get so divided on predestination, how you worship, on these other things, when the core values are still there. And so I just want to give you a couple of filters I use personally when I study the Bible, and you can see if this works for you. When I'm reading a scripture, and I'm wanting to understand it, and I'm praying over it, and I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to share with you guys, this is what I do is I look at the Scripture in the context of the whole Word of God. I don't take one Scripture and go, whoa, that's so divisive. It's so different than the rest of the Word. Let's talk about that. No, let's see what the whole Word in general would say about that Scripture. What does the context of the whole Bible say about the Word? That's the one way that I use to study the the word, the other way that I want you to see is when I'm reading the word of God, I look at it in two different ways, and that is prescriptive versus descriptive. I look at the word of God, and sometimes it is prescriptive, sometimes the word of God is descriptive. You may not have a clue what that means, but I'll tell you. Sometimes there's things in the word of God when you read it, it means you're supposed to take some of it and do it. Does that make sense? You're supposed to take of it and you're supposed to do it. Other times when you read the Word of God, it's not telling you to do it. It's telling you what happened. That is descriptive. And a good example of that is in the book of Acts when they were replacing one of the apostles. They went and they went over and rolled dice for it. You think that's how God wants us to name the next pastor? You think that's what God's wanting us to do? No, but that's what happened. That's what happened. It's not giving you the, 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 the list of ways to, to get the next leadership. It's not. It's telling you that's how they did it. And we've got to be able to divide that within ourselves as we're studying the Word of God. Is this something I'm supposed to take and I'm supposed to do something with it? Or am I learning what happened? Now, I don't know why I'm off on this tangent, but this is where I went this today. And uh, I feel like I'm just supposed to tell you all this stuff, so I'm just going to keep going. Um, now, whenever you're studying the Word of God and, and you start looking at things, you, you, some things just talk about God's character. Now, God's character never changes. His character never will change. And so let me tell you this. We've had a number of people that have asked me over the last several weeks, and I figured at some point I probably ought to at least tell you how I feel about it, have asked me about homosexual marriage. They asked me where we stand, if our, if our pastors would participate and officiate the weddings, and I'll tell you that the, where we stand is we will not. And we won't do that. And it's in our bylaws we won't do it. We wouldn't, I wouldn't personally do it. I, I wouldn't do it. I don't believe that. I believe it's the right thing for us to do. And the reason I believe it's not the right thing to do is because the Word of God is very clear when it comes to God's character and how He feels about that. It's very clear. It's not debatable. It's not one of these things where you can go, oh, I don't know. No, it's very clear. It's very clear. But what I also want you to know is that is not the only reason I wouldn't marry somebody. I'm not going to marry people where one's a believer and one's not. Why would I? Why would I want to unite people that are entering into a, a union that should be about one thing, about honoring Jesus, about honoring our God, which they're entering into this relationship unequally yoked? Why would I do that? And I tell you that because we get off on one subject and we can go, man, we're going to have homosexual marriage in here. No, no, no. We want to have marriage that honors God no matter what it is. No matter what it is. And so we want to make sure that when we enter into a union that both people are entering into it with the same heart. Same purpose, because a marriage in between two is between three, and they become one. And if it's not, I mean, I actually have some people in here today that uh, are doing premarital counseling with me, and I like, uh, I talked to them into coming, and I think they felt like they had to. Uh, I talked to them into coming, but I keep, I keep telling them, hey, if you, if you don't want to do those things, roll the dice. Roll the dice. If you don't want to make your marriage about God and have him at the center of your marriage, Roll the dice. We're going to talk about that next week. 
Can't wait to do that. That's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. Let's see where we are so I can continue. Okay. Didn't plan on all that. Okay, it says, um, there is one body, one spirit. There is one body, and in the body, the body of Christ, we are the body. And in that body, there is a head of that body, and that is Christ. And in, amongst the body, there are many parts. And we, as part of the body, should have a function in that body. And so here in just a moment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about what the role should be for us as believers as a body. What does that look like? And I'm going to give you something that I think you will always remember. Before we get there, let me finish going through these. There is, there is one spirit. There is one hope. There is the hope that is talked about here, I believe, is a hope of uh, eternal life, the, uh, the heavenlies. I believe that's, that's the case. We're talking about one baptism. We're talking about one Lord, one faith. There are seven things that he says there are one of, which, by the way, is the number of completion, which it's kind of ironic. He talks about the number of completion when he talks about one and unity and what we should be. These are the things that we should focus on, that there's one God, one faith, one spirit, one baptism. One, those are the things. It's not the other things that we get distracted on that have made these other churches and denominations. It's about coming together for one purpose. That's what it should be about. May we never get distracted about the other things because we easily can. We can. And so with that said, I'm going to take you down a little journey. And so, Ryan, if you want to go ahead and come up and we'll finish with this. I guess it was a couple of years ago I heard a sermon that I believe is the most impactful sermon I've ever heard. It was from a, uh, the Team Impact guys. Y'all remember them? Anybody go see them when they were here? Uh, you know, they, they look a lot like me, but a little stronger. Uh, <laughs> I just had to say that. Well, the guys had a great message to give, you know, during the days they were there. But then they came to a weekend service, and the guy had, get, gives this message. It's the guy that is like their lead guy, their spokesman. And he had already written a book on this specific subject. And it basically is the role of the body. Our goal our purpose. What are we supposed to do as believers and as followers of Jesus? What does that mean for us? And so whenever he gave this message, man, it just resonated with me. And I want to share it with you today. And I think you'll always remember it. He took us to Mark chapter 2. And I'll read to you just a little bit of that. The top of my Bible reads, Jesus forgives and heals a paralyzed man. So a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such long, large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some of them came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Now since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. In case you don't know the story, eventually he's going to get off the mat and walk. What I want you to see are two things here. The first one is this, is these four men believed that Jesus could heal their friend. And so they would do anything to get him there in front of Jesus so he could be healed. And who in here knows that when you start to go after Jesus, there's going to be some obstacles. There's going to be some struggle. There's going to be some things come your way. It just happens every time, right? It's not a coincidence. You start tracking Jesus. You start following Jesus. There's going to be some adversity. I promise you, it always happens. But these guys were relentless, and so they thought outside the box, man, we ain't going through the door, we're going through the roof. And so they dig a hole in this roof, and they have ropes on this man's mat, and they lower him down to Jesus. And church body, that's exactly the role of the church. That's exactly the role of the body. And that's this. 
we as a part of the body, a functioning body of Christ, our purpose should be to get people as close to Jesus as possible. Because we can't save nobody. We can't save a one of them. I mean, I could talk about Jesus all day long. Man, I get excited about it. But I ain't saving nobody. Only Jesus saves. So our role as the body is to get people as close to Him as possible. That's why we're here. That's why we unite. That's why we do the things we do. And so if you ever want to know what your purpose is, you don't have to get all creative. Just think about your purpose. It's the same as my purpose. is to get people as close to Jesus as possible. And in this case, what these men did to get the, this paralyzed man to Jesus was, is they held a rope. Is it coming back to you now? You heard this? They hold the rope. That's the only role they played. They just got up there and they dug a hole and they started lowering that man down. They were holding a rope. For the man to get closer to Jesus. Because they knew if they could just get him closer to Jesus, it would heal him, it would change his life. Not for a day, but for eternity. Not just get up and walk, but spend eternity with me. If people just get closer to Jesus. Oh, it gets me so fired up. So I want you to think about what that looks like for me and you. What does it look like for me and you? In fact, I'll tell you, somebody holding the rope right now, we got some ladies back there right now holding babies. Holding babies so you can sit right here and worship Him and to hear the Word. They are holding the rope for you. They are holding the rope for you. We've got people that come in here and set this place up. They are holding the rope. But the rope does not stop in this place. When you go to your workplace, you should be the the Jesus that they never saw. And when they see you, they see Jesus. You are holding that rope saying, here you go. Here you go. I just want you to put your hand on it and go with us. Just go with us. I want you to hold on this rope. I want you to know where it leads. I want you to know the destination if you're holding on to the rope. And we're all going the same direction with one purpose, with one body, with one faith. Come on, church. Hold the rope. Do your part to get somebody close to Jesus. That's what the body is supposed to be like. That's what it's about. That's what our purpose is. It doesn't change. We can get fancy with it and get creative, but it's always for one thing. Let's get people close to Jesus and let him save them because we don't. That's all I got for you today. That's all I got. That's all I got. Let me play for you. Father, thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for loving us and allowing us just to be part of the journey, God. Father, I pray that you will allow us to find ways to reach our hand out and grab that rope and pull with all we got in the same direction with the same purpose and same goals make a difference for your kingdom not for us God God may it not be just a a rope that's pulled inside of a few walls but in a community in a city in a nation Father I just thank you for your loving grace In your precious name, amen.